Are you kidding me? We're on the fourth episode of the What is Cycling podcast, and that's wild. On today's episode, we have a very special guest with us. His name is Lucas Liverman. If you don't know Lucas, Lucas is a local pro in the Triangle area in North Carolina. Lucas is great because he uses his platform and abilities on the bike to promote mental health and wellness. Stay tuned as we discuss cycling and how it affects mental health, struggles, and confidence. Let's go. Welcome, Lucas. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I'm very excited to have you on. You, personally for me, I do this podcast out of selfish reasons. I like having these conversations with people and you, <laughs> I can say, are an inspiration to me because not only oh, thank you. do you use cycling just to better yourself, but also you use it to better the community and push positivity and help other needs as well. So I guess just give us a background about you and your cycling. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm 38. I live in uh, Durham, North Carolina with my wife, uh, five cats and two bunnies. Um, and yeah, cycling background is I started when I was 13. Uh, I had like attempted every other sport that there was and I was always too, too small, didn't get picked or anything. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, this is a bummer. Um, but then, uh, I, I, I found out about bike racing in my, my little hometown that I grew up in and, uh, talked my parents into buying me a bike and got a bike, uh, finished dead last in my first race, but I was hooked and, uh, yeah, it kind of just grew from there. Uh, raced, you know, all through my teens, uh, through high school and stuff. Um, started off as a mountain biker, uh, and then, uh, over over the years and uh you know racing every national championship there was and raced up to a world cup level uh turned pro when i was 21 and i i kind of felt like i just like hit a wall with the the mountain bike scene um it wasn't i, I didn't really feel like there was anything new that i was doing it was just kind of doing like the same races every year uh so i started road racing uh found cyclocross uh, and then, you know, the fish, they kind of made a switch to racing, uh, road and cross full time. Uh, I've raced for, uh, some pro and domestic elite, uh, teams over the years. Uh, and then over the past few years, uh, I've kind of weaned out the road racing and crit racing a little bit. Uh, I like keeping my skin on me yeah, more these yeah. days. It's me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, but, but I found gravel racing, uh, and I've always enjoyed like the long endurance stuff like in training um so then i you know kind of gravel racing started to pick up some steam in the u.s and uh it just seemed to be a good fit like it, it kind of fit the way that i just liked to ride in general uh rather than you know trying to race a hour long hour and a half long crit every weekend um and yeah and so that's that's kind of where i'm at now I'm just racing gravel full time i still race cyclocross in the in the winter um but it's a shorter season so uh there's certainly mo like the most of the year spent uh gravel racing and, and training for like the long gravel events yeah that's that's me as well because it's just like there's something about gravel that's not only with the races and stuff but it just seems like more of an adventure like with crits and stuff i think crits yeah. is the best way to get the crowd out there and like it's probably the one event where it seems more like a true sporting event, but gravel, right. it just seems like it's for the person that's competing in it because you get to, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I really like gravel that as well, but. And crits are definitely fun. Like you said, I mean, it's, it's spectator friendly. <laughs> like it's, it's full gas the whole time, especially if you're doing like the, you know, bigger, like NR secrets and, you know, stuff like Athens twilight and Tulsa tough, um, you know, racing at night and just, you know, 20, 30,000 drunk spectators standing around the yeah. course yelling at you. And it's, it's fun. Like it's, it's, I do, I do miss it sometimes. Um, but you see a but, crash uh, and it's like, no, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was, when I was 25 and, and taking risks and not really thinking about, you know, how I was going to feel the next day if I, if I lost all my skin or broke something in a crash, yeah. it was different. But, uh, yeah, at, at 38, almost 39, I don't get up quite as, as easily as I did, <laughs> you know, 10 years ago. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Do you remember your first bike? Yeah, it was a, uh, black, uh, GT saddleback. Okay. And is that a mountain bike? 
Yep, yep. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I think definitely coming in last is a rite of passage. Every the first race you do, either you got to get dropped or just come in last, just so you know. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> and every time I've made the switch, like you know, when I when I started mountain bike racing, and then like when I switched to road, and I've switched to cyclocross. Um, even within mountain biking, like when you, you know move it up through the ranks, you know back when I was doing it, it was there was no cat one, cat two, cat three, so on. It was, uh, you know, beginner, sport, expert, semi pro, and then pro. Oh no way, I didn't know. That. Um, yeah, and there was no US, USA cycling. It was it was Norba National Off Road, uh, something or other. I was a long time oh, ago. Oh, gotcha. Uh, dating myself a little, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean every every time I moved up, it was you know it was back to back to back of the pack again um you know so it, it ah, kept it interesting yeah but, and i but i yeah. think that's the right move because like coming from or in your scenario like coming from mountain biking and stuff into cyclocross like you have the handling there already and then you also have the short burst of energy but like if you can extend it out longer it makes you just such a phenomenal crit yeah. road, whatever and it's something that you see less of, I think, these days, uh, you know, especially with like juniors coming up through the ranks and stuff. There's just there's so much more available to new riders, young riders, whether it's, you know, power meters or coaches or uh, training programs or whatever. And so you, I think what happens is you get these like really talented riders who are physically very strong and they're and they're capable of riding, you know, in the two field and the cat one field or, or, or whatever. Um, but because they're so strong, cause they have all these, like these, you know, things at their disposal to, you know, move forward quicker is you don't get that well-rounded skill set. Yeah, so you, absolutely. You, you get riders, you know, in these, in these big crits or road races or, you know, not as much in like cyclocross races and stuff, but, um, they're physically talented enough to be there, but they're in way over their heads when it comes to the skill set that they have. And so you, you get crashes and it, everyone's so anxious to like move up, move up, move up. And I think at some point you need to remember that slowing down makes you better, you know? Yeah. Like staying in your lane because some, I know some people come in and they're like over overly confident when they haven't had the experience or they're underconfident mm -hmm. and they're just like right checking the whole time and stuff. And it's like, right. You're going to hurt someone else or you're just going to lay yourself out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when did, but... when did it click for you that you could do this like full time and you wouldn't have to get like a full time job? Oh, I mean, I've, I, I, I most of my life or m most of my cycling career I've, I've had a job through all of this um, oh, okay nice I, there have been times when i haven't um when i was younger though i would say for my teen i mean i, I started working when i was 15 at the local bike shop uh, and i would say probably like through my tw you know all the way through my 20s um i was working part-time um granted the jobs were always like you know very part-time um, focus is always still racing and training. Definitely. Um, but I, when I turned pro when I was 21, I, I don't know. I think that was probably the point where I realized that at least cycling could be what I might, what, what my main focus was going to be on. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, any, you know, part-time job, job on side, whatever was going to be, you know, simply to just kind of like help like subsidize what I needed in order to, you know, focus on the, the cycling path that i had set myself on yeah um so yeah i guess when i was about 21 um I, when i was 20 i was the number one ranked semi-pro in the country uh so when i moved up to to the pro level um you know i was excited and thought you know okay well i, I can do this and yeah. you know, I'm coming off of and you know promptly got my butt kicked in my first pro race um but uh but yeah that was that was kind of my my turning point or at least shifting point because it you know, after that, I went on to be like an alternate for U23 World Championships team. Um, that's when I started getting up into racing, like at a World Cup level. Um, and that's when, like, I, you know, I was able to start getting on smaller teams. Uh, again, this is all back in the mountain bike days. So like being on a, uh, we were a UCI um, level or UCI licensed mountain bike team. Um, but yeah, since, but it's been in my 30s when I've been able to just solely focus on on just racing and a, and a very large part of that is due to having an extremely understanding wife who <laughs> lets, <laughs> lets me uh be a, a pro athlete yeah that's awesome uh, so so I, I see why you wiped her down <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no she's she it, and that's you know that's been one thing that's really kind of made a difference in in 
my career path has just allowed me, you know, her understanding uh, and, you know, acceptance of, of w- what makes me happy and what keeps me motivated and being able to focus on this full time has really kind of shifted the way that I'm able to uh, pursue it. Um, and it's maybe, ha- you know, it's made me happier. You know, we're happy with it. Um, it's It's been a, a really big source of support and it's definitely made a big difference. Yeah, definitely. That brings up a good point. Like my wife and I, she can tell if like I'm not writing enough because it's like, I won't be short, but I'm just like, she can tell I'm not as happy as I usually would be. And since we moved to Washington state, I still work East coast hours. So I have Ah. a buffer now, which is kind of cool, but it means like I have to log in to work at six, but I get off at two. So then I still pretty much have like a few hours before she gets home from work. So I can go out and ride and stuff like that. But she, it's just really funny. She's like, you haven't been riding as much. Like you need to go out and ride more. And I'm like, yes, thank you. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The last pro uh, road team that I was on, we had a, we had a coach on the team. So I had, I had a coach at that time. And uh, I remember, I don't even remember. It might've been after an injury or just like a planned break after like a big race block or something. And uh, I had a prescribed like week or two off uh, and uh my wife Des made a post on Facebook and tagged my coach in it and said, "You need to let him ride his bike. He's getting on my nerves." So, <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So. so, how would you explain? Because I know that a lot of people who aren't into cycling, they, when they hear about cycling, all they can think of is like the Tour de France and yeah. Oh, you're riding a lot. You're going to be Lance Armstrong. Like, yeah. How would you, how would you explain to someone that you're a professional in cycling but you're not doing Tour de France? <sighs> That's a really, man, that's a, that's actually a tough question. It's actually one I, I, I struggle with, um, being able to answer in a way that, uh, that gives an answer that's still like satisfying and appealing to whoever has asked the question. Um, because one of my goals in, with my, you know, the career that I'm in now, uh, or with where it is now is to be able to show that you don't have to be a tour de France athlete. You don't have to be an Olympic athlete to still be a professional athlete, that there's a, there's a hundred different levels between where you start and that, and that being that there's, that there can be a level of professionalism at any, at any point within that. Um, so I don't know, like, it's hard. Like, I, when people ask me, like, what I do, the, the obvious easy answer is to say, you know, if they, I say I'm a professional cyclist, uh, and, you know, the easy answer is to say, I do, I do like the Tour de France, stuff yeah. like the Tour de France, <laughs> but, but not the Tour de France. Um, but I hate giving that answer because it, I feel like it kind of goes against exactly what it is that I'm trying to, like, show. Yeah, which is, absolutely. You know, you can be... You, you know, for example, like, uh, let me take like Legion for, ex- you know, as a good example, every one of those guys is a, is absolutely a professional athlete, but they don't race in Europe. They don't, they're, they don't not race in the tour. They're, they're, a, an amazing American career racing team. Mm-hmm. Um, and no one would ever say that they're not professional cyclists. Yeah. I mean, like they're the um, best in crits. So, yeah. I mean, even you know, even like a team like butcher box, uh, you know, they're, they, those guys are professional athletes. Yeah. Absolutely. Know, and some, some of them do race in Europe, um, you know, on, you know, from time to time. Uh, but I think that, that that's just like one example of, you don't have to be racing in the tour. Yeah. You know, there's, there's lots of different things. Uh, Ian Boswell, He's, oh, a, yeah, he's, perfect a pro, example. he's a pro gravel racer. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't ride for some big professional team. He doesn't have a whole bunch of pro, you know, teammates. It's him. He's got his, you know, his private sponsors, you know, the, the people that support him. Um, and, you know, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't dare say that Ian Boswell is not a professional athlete. Yeah. And I mean, he's and, wrecking everything too. So. Oh yeah. I mean, and, but like, and, and those are just like some examples. I mean, there's, there's tons of other men and women that are doing the exact same thing and they're amazing and so talented. Um, you know, but that's, I guess, obviously not to their level. Like I'm, I am worlds away from being as fast as Ian Boswell, but that's the category that I put myself in. Uh, you know, do I, do I win a ton? No, I don't. You know, is it, I, I, most of the time I don't even podium, but it is, 
but I still, I am still a professional athlete. This is still what I do. Um, you know, I think you, I think people get hung up on like, you have to, you have to be winning everything. You have to be yeah. on the podium all the time. Like you have to be the fastest, fastest, fastest. Uh, and you don't. And so that's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I, I I'm trying to kind of bring some attention to and just say like, Hey, look, this is, this is me. I'm, I'm a, I'm an aging athlete. I don't have, <laughs> you know, the biggest team or the biggest sponsors, but I love my sponsors. Um, you know, but I'm, but I'm still a professional at what I do. Yeah. And it's like, and I can see it from the outside looking in, if you don't know anything about a sport, but the only like word association, all you know is Tour de France. It's like, oh, so yeah. Tour de France and everyone like, everyone thinks that if you ride a lot, it's like, oh, you're training for the Tour de France. And it's like, no, that's not the case. Like, actually I'm training for like this ultra endurance race or something like that. Mm -hmm. But, and people don't understand too, that they train the cyclist from such a young age to be in the Tour de France. Like, I don't think yeah. someone can come in at 27 and just get into the Tour de France. Unless, I mean, I'm sure it has happened, but... Uh, yeah, it happens I mean, it's definitely rarely. happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's happened. And it, uh, it tended to happen... <sighs> nah, that's not even true. I was going to say it tended to happen more, like, in the, in the like, 90s uh, than now. But, it, you know, it's, it still happens. Um, I can't even remember his, his name right now, but there's a, uh, he d used to ride for EF and now he rides for, uh, one of the other world tour teams, but he was a, he was a runner. He's, he's a Canadian rider. He's a runner forever. Oh yeah. Um, Woods. Yeah. Yeah. I can't uh, think of his Michael, first name. Michael, Michael Woods, Woods, right? Yeah. Yeah. Michael, I think so. yeah he was, he, he was an elite level. And granted he was, he, he was an elite level athlete in a different sport. So it's it, like, he's obviously like has the, the physical ability to, to do it, but, yeah, he was a runner and he came in really late, like late, late twenties, close, I think right around 30 ish. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, he's had tons of success. Yeah. Yeah. He's a star. Um, so it's, yeah, I think, you know, I like, I like being able to, to kind of push the idea that you don't have, you know, you can be, you can be young, you can be older. You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to fit the mold exactly right. You know, according to what the world thinks, uh, an athlete should be or cycling thinks an athlete should be to to be an athlete yeah i love that i i love not fitting the mold um but now i want to talk about last week and yeah. last week is just something crazy and this is the <laughs> second year that you've done this or the uh it's the i think it's the third year actually third year okay because i caught wind yeah. of it last year and i was like yeah. that's insane yeah, but so, so the, why don't you tell people what you did? And it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so May is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, along with being uh, Bike Month. So, uh, as in, it's a bike rider that has struggled with mental health uh, the majority of my life. Um, I figured that I would do do something to put those two things together and and bring some awareness to to both. Um, so, uh, like you said, this was the third year that I've done like a, a crazy challenge and each year I've tried to up the challenge to make it a little bit bigger than the previous year, which I'm getting myself into trouble because <laughs> it's year, so awesome year, though. Year, year four already sounds horrible, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's seven days to start on a Monday, finishing on a Sunday. Uh, and this year the goal was to ride 150 miles every day for seven days. Um, and so that was the, what I was using to create a platform. But the bigger part of it was along with like a ride report for each day, um, which was brief. Um, I would share uh, a story from either my, my previous battles with mental health, uh, sometimes current battles with mental health, uh, just things that I have going on in my head, in my life uh, that maybe not everyone would know about me. Um, and I use it as a way to kind of show that uh, being vulnerable isn't a bad thing, that mental health challenges shouldn't be seen as, uh, you know, a weakness or, or something to be ashamed of. Um, and then this year, I was also using this as a way to raise money for the uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, and I had a goal of $1,000 or to raise $1,000. Uh, and I was so pleased that everyone pitched in 
Uh, and we actually got up to, I think, $5 shy of $1,400. Uh, oh, so nice. Blew, blew my goal away, which was really cool. Um, and the the support, just messages that I would get, you know, private messages or even comments on on the posts that I was making from day to day on my Instagram and Facebook. Um, really nice. And, and, you know, even if just one person, which it was more more than one person, but even just hearing like one person say like, uh, you know, thank you that, yeah, you know, hearing your story or hearing you speak about it, you know, makes me feel not so alone or makes me realize that like what I have going on and, you know, shouldn't be ashamed of or embarrassed by. And that was the whole, and that was the whole point. Um, you know, I wanted, I wanted to do something crazy to kind of bring, to make people like pay attention to it. But the whole point of it was to, uh, you know, start conversations, raise some awareness and start breaking down the, the stigma behind mental health and, and particularly with men. Um, I think as, as guys, you know, grow up, you know, very often it's, we're made to, uh, made to feel like uh, not that it's, you shouldn't share, that you shouldn't be vulnerable, that you should be act, tough and manly. Yeah. yeah. Act, act tough, which I hate. I hate when people say, well, just man up. I hate that. Sentence. Yeah. It's, like, it's so ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so, you know, just being able to, to share, share parts of myself, uh, share experiences that I've had. And, um, it was nice and it, it was helpful for me too. It helped, it, it allows me to kind of reflect on my own situations, whether they're past or present and, uh, helps me put things into perspective, you know, regarding my own battles and, uh, where I'm at and, you know, what I need to do to help myself. So, um, yeah, it's a fun thing. It's uh, it's emotionally and physically absolutely exhausting. <laughs> I bet. Um, <laughs> I believe I, it. The the last day, I, I I was, I'm pretty sure I was actually like in tears the, the last ten kilometers, and just the realization that like, oh, it's it's over. Like I can, I don't have to run a bike tomorrow. <laughs> but at the same time, just like, feel like I, this this was so cool. Like I, these all these miles ridden, all the support that I've gotten, um, you know. It was it was fun. It was it was fun and painful in all the all the best ways possible. Yeah, and it's like I do love that like you were saying, you brought awareness, you raised money for a great cause, but also you kind of made a sense of community. People really like I don't know if I I guess I'll call it a project, but like your project. Yeah. yeah. It was like you had a sense of community. You had so many people pushing you, but you were having such a positive effect on people as well. And they got to see the play-by-play kind of. And that really, I, I think that made it even more meaningful to everyone. Because like oh, to well, see you. you in like, for one, you're crushing it. Like oh, 150 miles a day. Most people could probably only do like two days and then that's it. But doing it for a week and then also doing it virtually, which that's just ridiculous too. Yeah, it's a... Uh... It's a little crazy, I'll admit it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, virtually is just mad because, I don't know, it's just riding inside makes it so much more boring. <laughs> At least for me, it's so boring. It's so soul-sucking. Yeah. But then to do that and still see your successes through everything and then hear your personal messages, it's just like, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and and, that, and it's a... Uh, this year compared to last year, obviously I up the miles a little bit. Last year it was 100% virtual. Um, this year I did do I did have some outside time, um, which added an element of uh, intensity to it because you know inside on Zwift, like you can you can keep your speed up and you know you're still doing like the same power and stuff, but inside is inside is not easier, but I will admit it is different. Um, yeah, it doesn't so exactly translate to, like, to outside, but it's right, still those hours. Right. The fitness does like the fitness gains that you do translate, but mm-hmm. the 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 way you ride it obviously is is different. Or the, yeah, the, it's like the, there's the, true wind and stuff that could be outside, right? And other stuff, other factors, right? So the the one outside day uh, that I did, you know, was on gra- mix of gravel and road, and so like the average speeds are like way down, and uh, did more climbing, and uh, so that was that wasn't like a a nine and a half pe- hour pedaling day, uh, probably more like, you know, 10, 10 and a half hours of action, you know, that is like, nuts. you know, outside time, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, and then doing that with already 300 miles in the legs in the previous two days, uh, you know, going out for a, a solo, you know, a single 150 mile training day, like, yeah, it's 
it'll be <laughs> tough, but like it's fine, no big deal. Uh, but yeah, trying to jump in on the bike and going outside to do it after you're already 300 deep is yeah, it adds a. As I've said it multiple it. times, but it's just nuts. Like it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what was the full yeah. stats of this whole week? Like miles, elevation, and uh, like, how many calories yeah. did you burn? So I wrote it down because I would never actually remember this. Uh, so calories I burned, it was uh, 29,211. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you know, for perspective, like I'm small. Uh, I'm like 58 kilos. Uh, so it's like 128, 29 pounds. So okay. proportionately speaking, like, that's a lot is yeah. between like four and 6,000 calories a day Four and yeah, four and 6,000 calories a day, you know, which if you're 128 pounds, it's a large, that's a large yeah. percentage. Of, and you don't have like, the weight to lose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and then it was, uh, 32,779 feet of elevation gain, uh, which that's, that's, that's not, it's a lot, but it's, and that's not like, that's not like astronomical. I mean, yeah. the guys, the guys that go out and like, Everest, they hit almost that in a single in ride. Like eight so. hours. Yeah, yeah, that, that's just crazy. That's, yeah, yeah I, that's crazy. Um, it was one thousand, uh, one thousand fifty four point eight five miles ridden, uh, and it was forty seven hours and thirty nine minutes of in the saddle time. Goodness, that it, like that's so. that would probably be like one of my best months if I were to do <laughs> those numbers. Like that's it's, it's so impressive. It's the biggest week I've ever done. Yeah. So that, yeah. <laughs> last last year I rode a thousand, just over a thousand miles. It was like a hundred and forty two mile average per day. Um, so this year, you know, when I upped it, I was like, I'm just, I'm just doing even one fifty a day. Like in my in my brain, thinking about it, like planning for it, it's like that's only like eight more miles a day. That's that's not a big deal. I was wrong. It, <laughs> it adds up. I mean, <laughs> it, what fifty six like, more miles? Yeah. Yeah, it feels like way more of a big deal when you're actually doing it. So yeah, definitely. So how how did it change from last year to this year? Was it just the eight more miles a day? Yeah. So just yeah, just upped it to like an even 150 a day. Um, so three years ago when I started it, it was ride 100 miles every day for seven days. And Still man, nice. that's that that seems like a walk in the park compared to, <laughs> to this. But at the time it, it seemed tough, uh, you know, it's, and it is like, I don't certainly don't mean to make light of it. Like that's, that's hard. Um, uh, so then yeah, year two is like, I want to, I want to break a thousand or hit a thousand miles in a week. Uh, and that was my biggest week I'd ever done at that point. Um, and then this year, yeah, it was just up to, to just even one fifty every day. So um, then what do you see for next year? How are you going <laughs> to up the ante? Uh, I have no idea. You're going to do um, it while wearing weighted vest and everything, man. I like part of me is like, okay, well I'll stick to the 150, but do it all outside. Um, which That'd would be tough, which would be hard. Um, and one of the reasons why I don't do why I limit my outside writing, it started when the pandemic started. Uh, my wife and I agreed that I would spend uh, more time on Zwift training, uh, you know, that to, to avoid, you know, ending up in the ditch because of some careless driver and not having yeah. medical resources available because everything was already overwhelmed. Um, and so there's still some of that, like I, I'll admit, like, I, I really don't like the idea of getting hit by a car anymore. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Been there, done that. It has never been fun. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I try to like ride inside, outside you know, enough to where I'm not like getting too sick of riding inside. Um, but yeah, I could do it like all outside next year. Um, maybe, I don't know, like maybe like drop the miles a little bit, but, but do it all outside or something. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Maybe I'll just be insane and up to like 200 a day or something. See, that would be we'll crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so That's madness. Uh, who knows? I've, uh, yeah, every year I've done this, I've questioned my decision making skills. But I, after uh, I how long? To... Like, how many days in are you like, ah, this sucks? Oh, day one. <laughs> day one. I get yeah. through day one, and I'm just like, oh, I, I, I made a mistake. I don't think I'd I can do this. Probably be three hours into day one and be like, yeah, you know what? This probably isn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I don't know. Like, I like. It kind of goes back to what you were talking about. How like gravel racing is more about like yourself and like being being conscious of like yourself and your own effort rather than being in a, in a crit where you're like, you know, obviously like racing other people 
you're still racing other people in gravel, but I like the idea of like pushing myself. Like I don't, yeah. I guess, I guess I like, I don't necessarily need the, like the guy in front of me or the guy behind me to, to, to push me. Um, if I'm having a good day, if I'm feeling like myself, if I'm not burned out, if I'm not like mentally struggling with something like my, I guess my greatest like source of motivation, uh, I, I can generate, you know, yeah. Like, I feel like I'm the me, same way on my own. Um, no, granted, like I get motivation from lots of other places, but I can, I can find a way to kind of have that, like fuel my own fire without there being like someone like to chase or whatever. So, um, but I think that's why I like these challenges is because it, I have, I have the, the, the motivation from, you know, outside support and, you know, putting out there what I want to do. So like, once I say what I want to do, like out in the world, like I, you gotta I do want it. it, I got to do it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course, like my, my, my biggest supporter is my wife. She's always, you know, I think you know, she's a, she's a runner. So she understands like the, the push factor. Um, but yeah, like, you know, she definitely doesn't let me choke. So yeah, uh, we've you know, been in, been in race situations and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I tend to question myself a lot more than, you know, she does or friends do or family. Um, but yeah, you, you know, I, yeah, but again, yeah, day one, I was like, nope, can't do this. This is too much. I, I overshot it. Like, this is crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like what you said too. Like, I think when COVID happened, that's one lesson that I had to learn for myself is that there's no races happening, but we're in charge of our own like challenges and pushing ourselves. Yeah. Yep. And so that's why I like, I started trying to go out and do like 200 miles, like randomly throughout the year and stuff, like one or two times and all that stuff. And it was just nice to be like, this is just for me. I'm it's me against me. I don't have to worry about anyone else. I'm not going to be getting a trophy or anything, but it's just nice yeah. to be like, how mentally tough are you? How much can you stand? And even if you fail, you can still see progress being made. And yeah. it's, oh, just, yeah. it's just the beauty of cycling. And it goes back to the whole, like, you know, you, you see, you see, you know, the results of, of athletes or, or, or whoever, whether it's, you know, running, swimming, baseball, football, cycling, whatever, like you see, you see the performance, but you don't see the, you know, countless, endless hours of work going into it. And, and that, Absolutely. and that's what, like what you just said, like being able to push yourself for like a 200 mile ride. I mean, you've, you've done big backpacking trips and, or, you know, bikepacking trips and stuff. And you've, you've been in situations where like, it was long days, day after day. And like, you have yeah. no one, there's nothing around you to push you except for yourself. Um, and yeah, I think when, when the pandemic hit, I think a lot of people found themselves in that, that situation. Um, you know, some people either took a break, you know, from sporting or cycling or whatever, which is totally fine. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes you need a break. Sometimes, it, you know, a forced break is good. And then some people found other ways to keep themselves motivated. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, but it's been nice to be able to like do these challenges because uh, it, it has like added a, um, it's something fine motivation that I didn't realize that I had. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you actually just reminded me about my bikepacking trip. That was one scenario where I was definitely in over my head. I hadn't trained up for it. And I think I the remember, first, yeah, the first day yeah, was like 134. It. Yeah, it was nuts. And so that first day was like 134 miles, like six, 7,000 feet of climbing with 20 extra pounds of, or yeah. yeah, probably 20 extra pounds on my bike. And I went from Raleigh to Winston. And yep. the only thing that kept me going was like, my friends are expecting me by this time. So I have yeah. to go and make it. Yeah. If not, this, I probably would have quit. <laughs> but man, I think those are like the, those are like the, the coolest moments. And those are the, those, again, like those are the things that people don't see. Like that's not a race that someone's watching. Like, yeah, like, those can be some of the most monumental like efforts that we ever do. You yeah, know, absolutely. Like, it, you know, it's like, and just where you just, you just like, screw it. I was like, just, you just send it. 100 yeah, percent like exactly. we're just gonna do this and like you yeah you get in over your head and it makes you start questioning things and like you think you're not gonna make it but like that's when you find like that's when you find that those pieces of yourself that you maybe didn't know were there or you had never accessed before and it's it's those moments that i think make 
each of us realize that we're we're capable of doing so much more than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah, absolutely. Like I was talking to um, Chris Thorpe on the first episode and we were talking about breaking through those mental walls. And it's like, once you put yourself into those scenarios where it's like, I'm in over my head. And even if you don't get to the goal, but you still progress, then you're like, something clicks. And it's like, oh, yeah. okay, I actually am capable. Maybe I just need to focus more on this area or whatever. But you kind of shatter that mirror and you're like, okay, I can do this. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And, you know, I see failure is just another another way to, to learn and be better next time. Yeah, it's just another rung on the ladder. Like even, even yeah, even if you the goal that you set you don't make, like I, mean, I, I screw up most of the things I do. Like I, I don't meet <laughs> my goal most of the time, but it's you know, it's like, okay, well, what did I learn? Like how can I like how can I get back up and do it better next time? So Yeah, yeah. Failure failure is just learning. Obviously you did experience doubt yeah. and boredom and stuff, but like how did you push through that? for these seven days? Cause I mean, I'm still talking to you and I can't understand how you can do that for seven days just from a boredom uh, aspect, but. Cause I'm really, really hard headed <laughs> uh, and stubborn. Uh, but yeah, not like, you know, like I've already said, like I, yeah, I, I doubted it every single day. I, I mean, I, in general, like first 50 miles would go by pretty quick. The next 30 would just be like, Oh my God. Like I'd get to halfway yeah. and then I have like, you know, the next like, uh, 20k would would be okay because it's like all right well i'm over the halfway point so like i'm like every mile after this i'm counting down um and then yeah and then, then after that it was just it was it was really hard uh i think, I think i'm definitely not going to sit here and say oh it was it was easy no it was like it was it was hard and it and i, I never really got i never got bored um I enjoy the solitude of, of training. So like, even if it's on Zwift, like I have this like weird ability to just like focus on the effort. Like I don't have, mm -hmm. like I'm not watching like a TV show. Like I have music on like in my headphones, uh, but like I'm not, I'm not watching anything to distract me from like the Zwift screen when I'm, when wow, I'm doing this on Zwift. Crazy. But, I but what, even whether it's like inside or outside, like I have this like, again, there are lots of times when I don't have this ability just because it's like I'm having a bad day or whatever. But I, when I'm on and I, and I can do this, I have this like good ability to be able to just like, it's like I can flip the switch and I can just focus and I can like the, the, the motivation for me at that point is the fact that I can like focus on every pedal stroke. Like yeah. I can just get into this like very like single minded, like train of thought um, and just go which is i know sounds odd and probably like just doesn't even like sound right to most people but it's yeah it's just how i am like i'm able to just sing you know, that's awesome focus on what i'm doing and i get into the last little bit and like you know one of the things that, that motivated me specifically for this challenge is what i was doing it for you know it because it to me i wasn't writing for myself i was writing for a cause i was writing for mental health awareness. I was writing to raise money for suicide prevention. Um, and so like, I feel, I guess I kind of felt like I had this like responsibility to, you know, the, the people who are watching and the, the people who are keeping up with it, the people who had donated, uh, to the cause, uh, you know, my fellow mental health strugglers and my, uh, fellow attempted suicide survivors to, to just like power through it. Um, and that gave me motivation. So, you know, I think about the fact that it's, you know, I'm writing for something beyond myself, beyond my own tiredness, beyond my own fatigue, uh, and all the people that are probably have been or are currently in situations where they would give anything to be out of the mental health battle that they're in and be able to be in the, this, the painful situation that I was in on the bike, um, you know, or all the people that have uh, died by suicide you know, and how, you know, their families wish that they were still here or what they, what they could be doing with their lives if, if, you know, they were still here. And so I think it's those things that as, as tough as it was, as, you know, just painful as it was at moments, all the moments, um, you know, I, I, I considered myself lucky to be able to be doing this at all. Yeah. Uh, and that, 
that made it easier for sure. Yeah, that's that's really cool. It's like, and I mean, I'll tell people that like, just don't take it for granted. Like whatever it is, like I was watching some video and it was like, I think it was probably like Steve Harvey or someone. And yeah. he was talking about once you change your perspective and it's not like, oh, I have to get up today and I have to go to work. Like think about the person who can't do that. And then it's like, right. I get to wake up. I get to go yep. to work. Like I'm healthy. I can breathe on my own. And if you don't have any mental battles, then never take that for granted because you don't know what anyone else is going through and how how much it affects them in their decision making through the day. Exactly. Exactly. And so what were some of the battles that like you went through through those seven days? Uh, I mean, the normal stuff, I guess. Um, you know, just general fatigue. Uh, like self doubt and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, self doubt, just you know, physical fatigue, being better or worse as far as being on top of my nutrition and hydration from day to day. Um, yeah, just like the the mental challenge of being at like, you know, mile seventy and realizing that I have eighty more miles to go. <laughs> yeah, um, that's but, the worst. Uh, yeah, that, I mean that was that was definitely tough, but it. And it's like really demoralizing. I get yeah. like that too. It's like you were saying how you kind of like section off the rides and stuff. And that's how I am when it's with virtual. It's just, it's so boring to me. Once I get up to like past 40 miles then I'm like, okay, I can go. And if it's like doing a hundred, okay, you get to 50s halfway. And then the miles just keep adding up. Then it's a countdown. Yeah. But getting to that first 20 or 40, it's so mentally painful for me. I mean, and yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, and everybody's, everybody's different. Like some, you know, some people, you know, I've got friends that literally the only training they do is on Zwift, um, you know, and then they'll, they'll go race, but they at like hundred percent of the riding, hundred percent of the That's training. That's crazy. Is on, is on How's their handling? Uh, <laughs> the, the person that I'm, that I'm thinking of now is, is good because, uh, he has spent the, uh, the greater part of his life uh racing professionally uh oh, okay gotcha so yeah he's 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 totally fine um but it, it, i didn't mention that i feel like there were a lot of people that got into cycling during the pandemic like through platforms like yeah. swift or like peloton or whatever all the others are and so then they start racing out riding outside racing outside and it's just like oh yeah, like this is not. the real world. Like this is access. Yeah. Like, like this is how it is. Yeah, that that steering app on Zwift isn't accurate. <laughs> yeah, and you also <laughs> lean too, and you can slide out at any given point. Yeah, so it's yeah, that, that kind of <laughs> made some things interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, and then I think another like pretty challenging part was the because of what it, the, the the challenge was and the reasons why I was doing it. It, it definitely brought up my own like emotions it, mm -hmm. it brought up my own like my own feelings and connections like with my own battles with with mental health and suicide um and it you know not I and mean, i'm certainly not in a position where like suicide is a, a thing for me anymore um i've thankfully been able to get through that but but it still brings up like the feelings from the from the past like it you know it reconnects me with um those parts of my life that uh for better or for worse like are there um and how so, did you get over that, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it took a while. Um, yeah. So uh, my my battle started when I was, I think I've always been prone to mental health issues. Um, for me, there was a specific trigger. Uh, when I was uh, 21, uh, my girlfriend at the time, she and I were out riding, uh, and she was uh, hit by an oncoming car and killed right in front of me um oh my goodness so that was my i mean for obvious reasons that was my my trigger um yeah so that next uh the next year i was i was in a pretty pretty bad place um yeah so on you know various medications for depression and anxiety and i probably should have always been on on those but hadn't been um so in and out of like therapy offices and i moved away from home uh permanently shortly after that about a year after that uh, which helped getting in, I, I moved from Greenville, North Carolina to, uh, this area, Raleigh, okay. Raleigh, Cary, Durham. Um, so that helped, uh, change of scenery, um, got re, you know, was able to like kind of refocus on, on racing and training. Um, 
but I I think though because I mean that was oh geez uh over 15 years ago I mean even just that shorter period of time uh previously like it the mental health was you really didn't talk about it yeah it just wasn't wasn't really a thing it doesn't mean people didn't have mental health issues but we certainly didn't talk about it yeah so, absolutely um not the way we do now at least but um yeah so i just i didn't talk about it i i kind of just carried on as usual sticking band-aids on it every chance i could get and uh, just keep pushing it down pushing it down pushing it down and then yeah it yeah just builds so it, up and builds up my anxiety got terrible like i had like massive separation anxiety uh in like friendships relationships um and it just it it was quietly getting worse and worse and worse uh and by quietly i mean it was screaming at me that this is like this is a ticking time bomb about to explode but i just wasn't paying attention to it uh and so i guess when i was in my late late 20s uh, i moved to atlanta briefly um uh, I actually got hit by a car when I was down there uh, on a training ride and uh, suffered my uh, sixth concussion. Uh, but that was the third concussion in six months. Uh, so that that was kind of like my that was like my end game. Um, I ended up being involuntarily committed to a mental hospital while I was down there, uh, which was not that much fun. Um, got out, moved back to North Carolina. Uh, and then it was shortly after that when, uh, I made my suicide attempt. Um, and when I woke up on my living room floor the next day, realizing that it had not, my attempt had not worked. Uh, I just, you know, it was, it was something in my head clicked and I realized that, that I either needed to ask someone to help me. I needed to like reach out, do something that I had never done before and actually me make the effort to find help uh, rather than having it, you know, forced upon me and fighting it every step of the way. Uh, or the next time that I attempted it, it would work. Yeah. Uh, and so I reached out to two of my friends that lived in Winston. Um, and within minutes, they were knocking on my door. Uh, and um, yeah, so it, it that that was the moment. But I, Definitely without them, I wouldn't be here. Um, they stepped up when I actually reached out in a, in a big way and uh, allowed me the allowed me the kind of the, the safe space that I needed to start like admitting to myself and realizing that I had that I had some issues that um, that I needed to finally address after years and years and years of not doing it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, kind of, that was, that was kind of the moment and, and the way that I got out, the way that I ended up getting out of it was, uh, to ask for help. Wow. And that, so that's, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Cause that is, I mean, that's really deep, but I didn't know about, um, your previous girlfriend getting hit and killed. That's, that would ruin anyone, like anyone's mental space. Cause that would, to see that happen, I, I couldn't even imagine how I would take that. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's not, not fun. Yeah. Well, well yeah, once fun. again, thanks for sharing that. Oh yeah, no worries. It's like I said, I, it, it, a lot of this stuff is still like, it's still difficult for me to talk about. Um, but it's just because something is difficult doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Uh, yeah. So and also for, like you're helping so many other people too, like just to, talk about it. And like you were saying, like you're creating that safe space for other people. And I think it's hard to find positives in things, especially like something like COVID. But I think that's one of the positives that happened with COVID is that everyone started to realize like their mental health is right serious and it's something worth keeping intact and keeping positive. And there's yeah. been those mass exodus and stuff from work and all that, that are like, if I don't have a good work-life balance, that's why I left one of my previous jobs during COVID because I was like, I don't have a good work-life balance and it's affecting me so much to where my wife is like, what is going on? And I'm like, it's just work, but it's like, you have to, yeah, like pretty much what I'm saying is that it's amazing that there's 
starting to be all the focus on mental health now. And I really, I'm glad that that is pushing forward, especially for men. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and again, I think it, 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 a lot of it boils down to just, and you can't force anybody to be at that, like in that place where they're ready, ready to make a change. Like, you know, the old saying, like, you can't help somebody who's not willing to help themselves. Yeah. You know, the, the person who's struggling has to, be ready and and want to make the change it doesn't mean that you don't have like a you can't have like a support group around you that are you know encouraging you in a positive direction um but i think the the way that it, it really changes is to just say okay I, i'm going to i'm going to ask for the help myself and i'm, I'm going to reach out um and i think i I personally think that the reason a lot of people don't is because they're afraid that if they reach out, there won't be anyone there to catch them. Um, yeah. And that was why I didn't. Uh, and I was pleasantly surprised and glad that I was wrong, that when I, when I did reach out, there was somebody, you know, there to catch me. Uh, so from your standpoint, so. how, so in your standpoint, you were the one that reached out, but from someone who sees someone else in kind of a mental battle, how, what would your suggestion be for them to reach out to that person? Like, how would they, how should they go about reaching out to them? Oof. Oh man. Because I know it changes per person and it, yeah. I, you never want to push that person away, but just to be like, Hey, I'm here for you. If you ever want to talk, I'm here for, for your safe space. Yeah. For, I guess for me, like if, if I was answering that question for myself, um, it would be to for for the other person to uh, create a sense of like stability and confidence, just to to allow. Uh, well, for example, I, I give it an example. So when I met my wife, um, that was when I really started to kind of like change and figure out that like I could I could be my true self I didn't have to be this version of somebody that I thought everyone else wanted to see Uh, I could actually be me and that there were there were people there or in this case her there was someone there uh, that was appreciative in like the most monumental way of that and so it allowed me to really open up it allowed me to you know start painting my fingernails you know and just mm-hmm. little things it sounds silly but like it, do the little things that for me made me feel more like me uh but that i never did before because i felt like i was going to be judged around every corner yeah um and so i think creating an environment where uh you're allowing whoever this whoever it is uh to understand that like there's no judgment whatever whatever you have to say, whatever you're, you need to do, whatever the situation is, like you can, you can be your true self and, and there won't, there won't be any judgment made for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's a, that's a hard question. And I feel bad. I, I hesitate like to answer it. Cause I don't want to like, I don't want to assume that I know what's, I don't want to assume like I know the best thing for everybody because I certainly don't. Yeah, it's going to change per person. Um, but just you from know, your I, standpoint, like yeah. how would you have wanted someone to approach you? But Yeah, just just to be there. Yeah. Just to, to create an environment where I felt safe and comfortable and like I could, I could say the things that needed to be said even if, you know, they were uncomfortable to say. Um, so, yeah, just safe space i don't know for what you know that means different things for everybody but yeah just a safe space yeah absolutely and so it's cycling has also brought you a lot of mental battles with like losing your previous girlfriend and stuff but how has cycling helped you with your mental health oh god kind of like more ways than i could even count uh when I was a, when I was a kid, it finally gave me a, a sense of place, uh, purpose. Um, you know, as an adult, I, I I can identify 
outside. I can, I can find confidence and identify with who I am outside of cycling. But, you know, as, as a kid, it gave me something to identify with. I was finally found something that I enjoyed that I was, you know, halfway good at. Uh, it was a, a, you know, a way to like just escape, you know, if I was getting bullied at school or picked on or whatever, like I could, I could hop on my bike and at least for whatever amount of time I was on my bike, like I, I felt confident. I felt, you know, like I could escape stuff. Um, you know, I've always been a competitive person. So like being able to, uh, you know, have feed that kind of competitive nature that I have, uh, has always, has been really good. It's, it's been a good, like way to get rid of like, you know, excess energy or, or, you know, if I was angry at something or sad about something. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, it's been, it's, it's, I've been able to travel and see all sorts of, you know, neat things and places and, uh, that I would have never been able to without it. I've made amazing friends that I would have never had, uh, you know, without cycling. Um, you know, I've gotten to help people in ways that, you know, I don't know that I necessarily would have been able to, if I hadn't had a, had a connection with cycling and the bike, um, just the community in general, it's, you know, overwhelmingly supportive as a whole, obviously there's, you know, people within any community that can be major downers and bummers yeah but, the bad apples um yeah but uh yeah just it being able to like have a you know a community a, a group of people that are just supportive and you know it's really cool that like overwhelmingly yeah everyone is just really you know they cheer for each other they're happy to see the other person do well even if it meant you didn't do as well as you wanted to do and um it's that's a good thing uh, yeah it's i more more communities more sports work environments whatever I, if they were more supportive i think you know would lend to a, a better culture but yeah just the the cycling culture in general has just it's you know it's probably saved my life countless times it, it, i probably don't even realize all the times that it has but um yeah from the travel to making friends to you know friends that are are basically family now it's uh I mean, it's, I can't think of a part of my life that it hasn't shaped. Um, yeah, I feel the so. same. It's like, as soon as I got into it, it just, it definitely made me feel more confident. Like, yeah. And especially once you start making yourself goals and start knocking off those goals and stuff, it's like you come into who you really are and it's, right. a, it's a great feeling. And then also like, like you were saying, the community, cheering others on, helping each other, just being able to talk with someone else who likes bikes. Like, it's just yeah i love cycling yeah it's just like it's just fun like it i I get on my bike and i'm just like i smile like it's just yeah it's just it's just fun you know and like we get one life it's it's a relatively short one like there's there's you need need to do the things that make you smile and my bike makes my bike makes me smile so uh i tell everyone that we're modern day cowboys riding a bike yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah so so what's the coolest place that you've traveled from, like, with cycling? Ah. Uh, or give me a top man, three. I'm okay with top three. All right, yeah. I, okay, <laughs> I'll, uh, a to- I'll, g- I'll give a top two. Uh, it's, it, California is always fun. Uh, yeah, I love I just, San Diego. I like, I like the terrain, just the – maybe and maybe part of this is just, like, the nostalgia of it. But, yeah, it's just, like, I just always had so much fun out there you know, like traveling with teammates and the races and it's just so different than what we get on the East coast. Um, I just have a lot of good memories from racing, uh, you know, whether it's like big bear, big bear, California, oh, yeah, or, that's awesome. uh, mammoth or, uh, Sonoma or like, uh, sea otter classic of race. There's that, so many uh, historic races out there. Yeah. Like, I mean, even like, even if I just think about sea otter, man, I've raced that race, like, I don't know, like 12 times, probably close to it. Oh, wow. Um, a lot. Yeah. And, and like, it's just a lot of fun. Like the trips out there, I think that was actually the race that I traveled to like by myself for the first time, like flew across the country when I was, uh, I think probably still a teenager oh, wow. um, by myself. So that, that was fun. Uh, rented a car for the first time on my, on my own for that <laughs> race. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, it's just a lot of like, fun lived experiences out there so that was a lot of fun um 
and then uh like the world cups up in canada were fun uh specifically uh the uh mont saint anne uh where is that in, it's a uh, in quebec canada oh yeah okay yeah the, it's at the ski resort there at uh mont saint anne uh and that was a lot of fun uh yeah again you know, and it this may just be like me reminiscing on like my racing my first world cup there but it, it was just it was cool um it's really cool up there like i've been to montreal yeah. and it's just a whole different vibe especially in quebec they speak french too so it's like yeah it's yeah. pretty crazy yeah uh but i went to montreal with my dad actually he was uh he got picked for the uh masters uh mountain bike world championships team when uh many years ago but so i went to quebec and he raced world championships up there oh that's cool and that was fun um so your yeah, dad races it, as well? He used to, yeah. So I it, I started off first, and then my brother got into it, and then uh, my dad got into it uh, to be able to, like, do it with us. And, uh, yeah, he was, like, he started off as a beginner, and by the end of the following year, he was already, like, an expert and had won, like, uh, national uh, the National Championship Series, an expert, and uh that's amazing and again he's racing masters so it was like ma basically like masters elite um and i got picked for world's team and so like the second year that he'd even like been on a bike and like he'd ridden a bike in that his is life, so obviously crazy. But, but never like never trained or raced or anything and yeah it's like i think he i think he top 10 at a at See, i think this is the very first time Usually it's always the father gets the son in because the father's been doing it, but I've never yeah. heard of the story where the son does it. The father gets into it and the yeah. father and son are both just studs in the whole thing. <laughs> That's crazy. So yeah, he was, uh, and you know, my dad's in his seventies now and he's, uh, paying for being a workaholic his whole life. But, uh, <laughs> um, no, nah, yeah, my, my, my dad's amazing. Like it, I, I, you know, all, all the like, hard-headedness and uh toughness that i've got definitely comes from him but yeah he's yeah he, he was he was great i mean he raced on the road he did a little cycle cross uh he was and he was always like held back by the fact that he like didn't get into it until he was in his 50s but um you know was, i definitely think it's one of those things that he had he found it when he was younger he would have been a, a household name yeah i mean that's still amazing still making the best use of his time that he has oh yeah yeah so yeah that's cool so as you know i put out on instagram people to ask you questions yeah so we have a little bit of a q a <laughs> all right and so the first one comes from dave mcdougall and he wants to know from your experience how do you avoid cramps on long rides huh everyone's a little different like the like the nutrition that everyone is comfortable with varies in general uh eating and drinking often uh definitely don't drink just water yeah uh, you got to get some sodium and salt yeah as I, I, that was uh some advice that i got from a, a coach one time and it was uh, not great advice but um <laughs> just to only drink water yeah when i was training yeah oh, wow. um but uh yeah there's it, nutrition has come such a long way like in recent years so you, you've got stuff like uh, uh like on the bike stuff like um scratch and uh tailwind and flow and uh, you know all these different things um and then you know there's but then there's also lots of stuff uh so like i've got a one of my nutrition sponsors is uh excess energy and they make they do a lot of work with like um all natural like energy energy drinks uh so like basically it's just like packed with like b vitamins uh and doing like a lot of like branch chain amino acids and just like hydration stuff before and after um i think a lot of people tend to focus on like what they're doing like in the actual moment of the of the ride to like fight off the cramps and stuff but if I think uh, equally as important, if not more, uh, is what you're doing before and after. Um, you know, so what you're what you're experiencing the day of, you're you're actually the benefits that you're getting from that. You're you're getting from like what you did the day before, the night before. Um, so, you know, it, the the usuals, good nutrition, eating, drinking often. You know, making sure that you're getting in enough sodium. Some people, you know, are are real heavy sweaters. Some people aren't. 
um, you know, trying to stay cool. Uh, one thing that really helps me if I'm doing like a really, really hot day is I'll actually take uh, uh, pantyhose and cut them off and stuff them with ice and then tie them off. Oh, yeah, that's a great, and, great and idea. And put, put them on my back and you just kind of get this like trickle of melting cold water running down you and so that it helps like keep your core temp down. Uh, so that's that's actually really helpful. It's an old like crit racing trick. Um, uh, but yeah, I think just finding like finding the nutrition that works, you know, whether it's uh, something you come up with your, on your own or, uh, you know, trying a variety of all the different uh, options they have, you know, out in the world now with uh, drink mixes and things like that. And then just, you know, making sure that you're you're paying attention to the the post ride stuff and the pre ride stuff, what you're doing the, the night before um, just to kind of you know, help fend off the cramps. I mean, at some point, like if, if you just, if you just run your body ragged, like at some point, like there's only so much you can do, you can, pro, you can prolong it. But like at some point, like you may just cramp up, like, yeah, just, yeah, it's just going to happen, unfortunately. But, um, and like, don't eat when you get hungry, like try to pace it out, try to like, yeah. even if you're not hungry, start getting some more fuel in your body. Because right. that's a, that's one thing I've noticed is that if I only eat when I'm hungry, I pay for it. And oh, like you were 100%. saying, the cramps will come. Right. And so like doing, eating enough right off the bat and like, like you said, like getting in that, those little bits here and there, like every, every five, 10 minutes, take a sip of your drink every you know 15 minutes, take, even if it's just a bite, but like take a bite of something, start like keep those calories coming in. Cause what happens is your, if your body starts to overheat and then it can't absorb anything anymore. It's just, it kind of goes in the shutdown mode. So no matter what you put in your body at that point, you just feel like it's not being absorbed. Yeah. And then it just all sits in your stomach and then just every, everything goes wrong after that. Yeah. So Absolutely. it um, turns upside down. Yeah. Don't like, you, that's a good point. Like, don't, don't wait. Like always, always stay ahead of it. Drink before you're thirsty, eat before you're hungry. Um, yeah. And then it's... Awesome. That was a really good answer. So the next one is a two parter from okay. Dylan Lawson. <laughs> and he wants to know Dylan. who is your favorite writing partner? Ah, Dylan, he knows I'm going to say him. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, so Dylan, and I, Dylan's one of my best friends. Uh, he, he's like a little brother to me. Uh, and we, like, we have a lot of history on the bike. Um, he's, he's probably the only person that, uh, I can, uh, I can ride with and we don't have to like talk about what, what we're doing. We can kind of just like, we just know what the other one's going to do, like yeah. what the other's reaction is going to be. Um, he's actually my one and only other teammate. Um, so, uh, but we've been racing together for a long time and, uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely my, my go-to, like, let's go do something really stupid and epic on the bike, buddy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. You gotta have those, <laughs> those riders cause like, or those friends, because when you do something like that, and like you were saying, if you can just get each other's vibe without talking, especially when you're both in the pain cave, you just somehow can work it out together it's great oh yeah we did he and i did a ride uh last year for my birthday it was uh, we, neither one of us had done a 200 mile ride before so we decided we were gonna ride from durham to uh wilmington uh to the beach uh on my, for my birthday so he he came up from atlanta because he, he lives in atlanta now and uh it was in july and eastern if anyone's familiar with the eastern north carolina it is uh void of any shade and it's nothing yeah. but cornfields and cotton fields and tobacco yeah. fields and it may be windy but the wind is also 100 degrees oh it's so uh, hot yeah, it's awful and uh i we i i overheated like massively with like 50 miles to go and like i think he and i pulled each other out of uh out of the gutter a, a couple different times on that ride um but uh yeah the, towards the end i just like i just cracked from the heat i just like way got into like a bad spot it's so easy to do he uh he told he told me to wilmington so that was one of our our real dumb epic days <laughs> yeah that's awesome and so his next question is how do you get through periods of low or no motivation oh uh, honestly by not forcing it um i think I think a misconception uh, with motivation is that people think that like successful athletes, highly motivated athletes are never not motivated. And I, I definitely could not be further from the truth. I mean, I'm not motivated 
all the time. And I have, and I, and that's like, I struggle. One thing I've always struggled with, and it's been better in the recent years, but I've in the past, I've always struggled with just consistency. Like I'd have like really good training blocks and then something would happen or like my anxiety or depression or just something different would happen. And I'd, I'd fall out of the, the routine and I'd have a, a week or two or longer where I just like it, nothing really clicked. And so like, it would just be this like, things were good, things weren't, things were good, things weren't. And that's, you know, okay. But if you're trying to be goal, goal oriented, that's not necessarily the best path. Um, but I think not forcing it and just finding, finding, instead of like trying to just like be motivated, I think identifying the reason why you're not motivated and then working to fix that. Because if you fix the causes of the lack of motivation, then the motivation comes back. And this is, again, this is me speaking from like my, my point of view for like my experiences. Um, so like finding, finding the cause, because if you can find the cause, and if you can work on the cause, then the motivation fixes itself. Um, but leaning on friends, leaning on spouses, leaning on partners, um, you know, leaning on your local ride, ride group. Uh, which I know that's been tough over the past couple of years with social distancing, but um, yeah, just, you know, not, if you, if you, if you want to ride, but maybe you don't want to train, that's all right. Go ride your bike. Like hop, yeah. hop on, like hop on the fixie, hop on the, the, you know, BMX bike, hop on the beach cruiser, like just go pedal. Um and just don't like don't be hard on yourself if you, you need to take like a mental health day like at the fine or a mental health week if you need to like find have a day where you just like sit in bed and drink coffee or you know you you just had a rough day and it's like i really just can't make myself get on the bike fine then go have a beer with a friend or you know something like it it, it you know it doesn't you don't it doesn't always have to be like forcing it and and making every single day like better than the next. Like it progress is so linear. Like there's gonna be days when you progress and there's gonna be days when you don't. But like but if you if you allow like those ebbs and flows to like work with each other instead of against each other, then you, you still end up with this like positive like trajectory. And so I have a follow up question to that. So how do you find what's kind of making you not want to be motivated? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that I really have a good answer. Uh, I'm trying to Cause with me, it's think. like we moved out to Washington. I don't know anyone out here. Yeah. It snows constantly. <laughs> like it's so yeah. much snow. So but I'm just like I'm so tired of riding on the trainer. But I want to get miles in. But right. I'm just like I it's just there's something that's just been so painful for me this year about being on the trainer. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what's changed, what switch has flipped, but it's just the trainer is just straight boarding for me. Yeah. And I think maybe that like that kind of goes back to what I was saying a little while ago about like when the pandemic hit and like some people found ways to be motivated and some people said this is a great time to take a break. Um, I think, it's so like for that, for like what you were just saying, it, you know, just take advantages of all the times when you can get outside and just, and just instead of making yourself like beating yourself up over the fact that like, that might not be every day, just be, you know, be mindful and in the, in, you know, just kind of in the moment so that when those, you know, those days are there, you can get everything you want, you need out of them. Like you can make those days long days or short days, whatever, epic days, big climbing days, big descending days, but just make, you know, make those days fun, make them yeah, what make you them want count. them to be. And then under, you know, and then just realize like, if you don't want to ride the trainer, if there's just no motivation to, to hop on that thing, then don't like, that's okay. It, yeah. It, I mean, that was like all of January. <laughs> yeah. That's, and that's perfectly fine. Like, and honestly, like you need times when you allow your motivation to wane so that it can, so that it can be there in full force when you, when you really want it to be. So like if you're forcing it and you're just like making yourself do things in January when the weather is miserable and like, you know, if, if the, 
if the forcing it comes easy and that's like and that's motivating and like you are motivated to ride in january through all the bad weather and everything that's one thing but if you're not then just don't force it because if that's the thing if you burn yourself out in january because you forced it all a month and now like come you know the you know may june july when the weather gets better and you're just like so immensely fried from doing all the things that you didn't want to do and you didn't want to do them now you can't even enjoy the, the times that you would be enjoying yeah that's a valid point and so this one was mine because i just had a random thought <laughs> about it but so if you had to compare your riding style to an animal which animal and why oh god <laughs> i feel like it, I feel like 38 year old me's answer to this is a lot different than like 24 year old me's answer to this would be. Yeah. Uh, I don't, man, I don't know. Like I, I actually, uh, I'd asked my wife about this and, uh, she, so her, her suggestion was a hippo. Okay. <laughs> and then, and I, and I kind of, I kind of see it. I kind of see it. It's maybe not like the most glamorous, uh, what animal would you be answer but uh you know most of the time they're just kind of there like minding their own business floating around uh but they can be real fast yeah and real aggressive <laughs> they you can be real aggressive and uh and if you make them mad they're gonna like come at you hard and they're pretty relentless like they will that's true they, that's, see, they, that's good. they would just like go 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 until whatever's they need done it's done uh and then they just go back to being chill yeah i like that so i i don't know i kind of like at first at first it's like ah, i want i don't want to say i'm a hippo but like <laughs> i don't know I, it, it kind of works like I'm, I'm pretty chill you know i like just doing my thing uh if someone makes me mad it's, you know it's uh there's this like thing floating around on like the instagram reels or whatever it's like this like uh you be careful who you make mad because uh, just because you can't see the beast doesn't mean the beast isn't there. Some people have learned how to like tame their beast. Oh yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So I, I kind of, I don't know. I kind of feel like that's me. Like as I've gotten older, I've, I've become more like relaxed and go with the flow and chill. But at the same time, like that, like uh, that, that ability to like flip the switch is still there. Yeah, that's a really good answer, especially yeah. that she explained it like that. That's really good. I like yeah, that. So, and yeah, so, yeah, the more she got into the explanation, I was like, all right, all right, I guess I'm a hippo. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of something like a wolf or a cheetah or whatever. Yeah. Like, ah, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, it's like but, I was thinking about it for myself, and I was like, I don't even know what I'd be. Like probably like a donkey or an elk or something, like just something that's not – you don't think is fast, but that they'll get from point A to point B no matter how long it takes. Yeah, like, yeah, that's, that's, that's like just yeah, that, calm, cool, collected. That's yeah, that's solid, <laughs> solid. I I don't know if you remember one of the last times I've seen you. I think it was last year, one of the cyclocross races, and I came up to you and you're like, "Who is this?" And you're like, "I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you because you don't have a helmet on." And that's the only oh. time I've seen you. <laughs> oh, geez, man, I don't even remember that. Really? Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, <You're> like, <laughs> I don't even know who you are because you're not wearing a biking helmet. And I was like. Oh yeah, that's literally the only times you've seen me has been yeah. with the cycling helmet on. Yeah, it's funny. My uh, Facebook memories today popped up a, a year ago. Exactly was when you posted the, uh, or it was when we did the uh, your interview with me out at the log. Oh and, yeah, uh, at Umstead. Yeah, Umstead. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so I guess we just have like this this occurring like year. Yeah, every trend. year we'll see you again next year. <laughs> All right, sounds good. <laughs> All right, I need to make a note. May twenty seventh, but that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lucas, for being here. Thank you for being honest and open about mental health and just thank you for raising money for it. But you can find Lucas on Instagram at Liverman13, on Strava at Lucas Liverman dash Bell Lap Cycle Works and on Facebook. But yeah, once again, thank you, Lucas, for being here. It's been such a blast and we will obviously have you on next year on may 27 <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a plan thank you very much for having me it's been uh it's been really nice getting to talk to you and uh being able to continue to share some of my experiences and talk about bikes it's always fun awesome well thank you so much cool thanks dude appreciate it